This is the 65th lecture in the FOA series of lectures on fiber optics. In this lecture, we'll be focusing on fiber to the home passive optical network design. This is one of a four-part series of lectures covering update topics on fiber to the home following our original lecture 25. We're looking at fiber to the home architectures, passive optical networks, design, which is this one, and the final one will be on installation and test. The most important thing to know is that any successful fiber optic network project begins with a good design. If you don't have a good design, you're not going to be able to build a good network. So we're going to look at what is involved in designing a network. The FOA has extensive educational materials online and as part of our YouTube series talking about fiber optic network design in general. And we recommend you review those also to go along with this particular focus on fiber to the home. Fiber optic design is a very specialized process which leads up to a fiber optic installation as part of a project. To design a network well, you need an in-depth knowledge of a lot of issues, like fiber optic communication systems and how they work, fiber optic components and systems, how they interact, and how to choose the right ones. You need to know fiber optic installation processes, whether it be outside plant or premises. And you need to understand standards and codes, local regulations that you must know in order to legally build a network. A lot of these subjects are covered in the FOA guide, and we recommend you familiarize yourself with those before you begin a project. Whenever anyone asks us about what's involved in designing a project or how to design a project, we start off by telling them that every network is unique. What you do in a given network is going to be different than what other people do, but we use many of the same concepts. Designers of a fiber optic network must consider the communication needs of the network, the geographic layout, whether or not there's fiber they can currently use or whether they'll have to do installation. In a fiber to the home network, you also have to look at the types and the distribution of customers. You have to look at the services you'll make available over the network and any requirements that the vendors you choose may also place on your design. So this is a fairly complex process. The place to start is always, what are the communication needs? What kind of network architecture and communication equipment types do you need? The geographic location of the network is also very important. That tells you how long the links must be and how and where the cable will be placed. When you know where the cable has to go, you often then know whether it needs to be installed aerial, underground, or even underwater. You have to know where you're going to locate splices, terminations, so you can get all the drops in the network. You have to define what testing is required to meet the needs of the communication system. And we always say the most important part is the documentation. The documentation is important so the contractors will know how to build the network and afterwards, the owners will know how to operate and maintain it, and if necessary, restore it when accidents occur. Industry standards and local building codes are very important to know also. Someone has to figure out how to build the network to standards and how to meet the codes in order to get permits and get the project signed off by the local authorities. There are some unique aspects of designing fiber optic networks. For example, where are the subscribers? 
Are they urban with a very high density? Rural with a very low density? Or suburban with something in between? Are they in multi-dwelling units, which is common for urban? Or in single-family homes, which is common for suburban and rural? When you design a network, you have to start off by defining where the subscribers are, but at the other end of the scale, you need to know where the head end or the central office is going to be located. You have to decide what kind of fiber to the home protocol you're going to use. Regular PON, like GPON, or do you plan on offering a 10 gig version, which might be only available for businesses? Remember both GPON and 10 GPON can occupy the same exact network at exactly the same time, which is really convenient. Within the parameters established by where the head end and the subscribers are, what network architecture are you going to choose? That's a big question because it defines where splitters are, it defines what kind of cables you need to use, and what kind of hardware you might be using at various locations around the network. The classic splitter location is near the subscribers, with a single fiber coming from the OLT to the splitter, and then drop fibers going to the individual subscribers. This works in a lot of areas, specifically in dense urban areas, where there are a lot of users. Some users decide to put the splitter in with the OLT in the central office or head end. There's really a couple of reasons for this, mainly though that it ma allows management of the network much more easily. It means you have to send a fiber to every subscriber, but with high fiber count fiber optic cables, putting 1,728 fibers in a single cable that you can pull through conduit in the city is not a problem. Where you do have the splitter near the OLT, you can more carefully manage OLT ports. You can get higher density to each OLT port, which can make a big difference in the cost of the network. In suburban areas where subscriber density is lower, cascaded splitters can make more sense. So that, for example, if you have a street with eight single-family residences on it. You can put an eight-port splitter there and connect up each of the homes with a separate drop cable. Since a single OLT port can handle 32 users typically, you can have four different streets being fed with eight-port couplers from a single OLT port. That helps design the network simply and minimize the use of fiber optic cable. If you are using cascading splitters, it's important to understand how it works. The total number of splits is 32, so you multiply the split ratio of each of the splitters to equal the maximum 32. So, for example, you can use 1 by 2s into 1 by 4s into another 1 by 4. Or one by twos into one by twos into one by eights, or you can use a one by four into a one by eight. So you multiply the splits of each splitter to get the total split for the OLT port, but you add the dB loss of the splitters. So what we've done here is we've shown the split ratios of different options for cascading splitters, along with the loss that the splitters add to the network. When you do a loss budget for that particular link that includes these cascaded splitters, you add the losses, the total amount of losses from the cascaded splitters to the loss of the fiber, the splices, and the connectors that you typically use for calculating the loss budget so that you get the total loss budget of the cable plant plus all the splitters. That's important to remember when you're calculating loss budgets for passive optical networks. 
When designing networks for multi-dwelling units, the splitter can be put into the entrance facility of the building and fibers run to each individual uh, apartment or unit in the building. Or in some cases, you can use the um, telecommunications cables that are already there for DSL over twisted pair, or uh, there's even a standard for running uh, internet service over coaxial cable called MOCA, M-O-C-A, that's been used in some multi-dwelling units. If you have an MDU with lots of units, you may want to use a cascaded architecture to minimize the runs of cables within a building, which can be difficult in some older buildings. So you put one splitter in the entrance facility, and then you cascade splitters, for example, putting splitters on each floor or each hallway of a building to connect up each of the units. There's some very sophisticated designs for fiber and connections that allow you to run cable like this 3M unit shown here where you merely stick cable to the joint between the ceiling and the wall. It's almost invisible, easy to run, and requires virtually no modifications to the building. Rural fiber to the home networks are different. The distances between subscribers are long and the construction and cable costs can be quite high. It's not unusual to see costs that are four times higher than in suburban or urban areas. Actually, because construction costs are high and fiber optic cable costs are low, uh, some people actually use point-to-point -point networks in rural FDTH. But there are methods that can be used to make passive optical networks work better in a rural situation. Some companies have suggested using taps of single fiber. So rather than using equal splitters that cause a 3 dB loss, you take a single fiber and put a splitter in that passes 90% of the light forward and splits off 10% to be used for the user. The problem with this is that there are excess losses in the splitters, and the loss budgets we've done for networks like this show that there's no advantage to this kind of network. Uh, some people may have situations that this works with, but let's say we're skeptical. A better situation that we've seen is using remote mini OLTs. These are OLTs in a cast aluminum box that looks like the distribution amplifiers that are used in hybrid fiber coax cable TV networks. You connect these up on fiber and they have a one or two OLT ports, which can serve a limited number of users in a small area, like, like a small town, cluster of homes, or a cluster of farms. These mini OLTs can be daisy-chained. So from one central office, you can attach one to a pole, drop to certain subscribers, continue fiber along to another one, and larger distances, the distances are almost unlimited. So it's a very interesting architecture that is being adopted in rural networks. The next part of the design process is you have to start choosing components. And we're looking mainly at the cable plant here, the fiber, which is normally standard G.652 fiber. The cable, the cable design is chosen by how you're going to install it. Is it aerial, where you would lash to a messenger or use ADSS? Is the cable going underground? Is it being pulled in conduit or direct buried? So the cable type depends on the construction. Connectors, most networks use SC connectors, and you'll find that most use uh, angle polish contact, APC SC connectors, to minimize the reflection in these short single mode links. Everything generally is going to be fusion splice, but some places there'll be connectors 
that are going to be used instead of splices in places you might not think. And the hardware? There's lots of hardware to choose from and you need to work with vendors to see what kind of hardware makes sense in your installation design. Fiber to the home has led to a lot of component development to reduce the cost of installation and reduce the cost of fiber to the home drops. Part of that is prefab cabling. There's a lot of systems being built around prefab cabling, like this one which shows here. A terminal with connectors that are waterproof is attached to an aerial cable attached to the messenger and all one needs to do to add a subscriber drop is to unplug the cap on a drop port and screw a connector on that's on a cable that goes to the subscriber and screws into a connector on a drop box on the side of the subscriber. No termination needed. All you have to do is run a cable. This has become very popular, particularly in urban areas. There's also special types of fiber optic cable that are being used for drop cables. They're not complex cables like the typical fiber optic cable you're used to. These are cables that are designed to be lashed to current cables or sometimes self-supporting like the one at the bottom which has a steel messenger wire on the side of it. They're easily spliced and terminated and there are special hardware used for these cables to simplify the installation. And of course you can get them prefabricated with connectors on either end. Nice weatherproof connectors ready to plug in to the drop box and the box on the side of the house or the building where the cable is being terminated. Here's a unique type of hardware developed just for fiber to the home. It's a bit of a hybrid between a patch panel and a splice closure. It's reopenable and the idea is that the incoming distribution or feeder cable is spliced to pigtails to have uh, connectors on a small patch panel in the middle of the box. Drop cables have special ports that they can come in so you can either use pre-terminated drop cables or you can take the drop cables, put them into the box and terminate them typically with pre-polished splice or splice-on connectors. This type of box has gotten a lot of usage particularly in urban and suburban areas where it greatly simplifies the installation process. There's lots of variety of what you'll find at the subscriber end of the drop cable. On a single family home you might find a box like this that has room for splicing the drop cable and it contains the ONT for the subscriber. There are then root, uh, routes for sending copper cables into the home for television, internet, and video. Some boxes are only demarcation boxes. They're basically splice boxes and a fiber optic cable will go into the home where the, the uh, ONT is going to be a box that looks like a cable modem and is probably sitting on a shelf or a desk somewhere and then connects to the homeowner's cables and or Wi-Fi. In a multi-dwelling unit you'll probably have some kind of wall-mounted panel or cable rack that terminates the fiber, connects to whatever ONT electronics would be in the entrance facility or just patches to fiber to go to the individual units in the building. As you can see, it's very hard to generalize because every subscriber location is basically unique and you have to tailor your network to whatever you find. At the end of the design process, you have to do a design review. And it's at that point you decide, will our design support the networks we want to run? Are the components compatible to the communication systems, the cable plant, and the locations that we're going to install them? 
Do all of the links have adequate power budgets for the network we're going to run? And will they be a little bit of margin in the pond network? And have we chosen components that meet all the environmental requirements? There's nothing unique about a fiber to the home network here. These are generalized requirements for any fiber optic network design. We've already mentioned power and loss budgets several times. Any kind of equipment, like the passive optical network ONT and OLT link, has a maximum amount of optical loss that it can sustain and still operate properly. So you have to check the specifications for the equipment you're using, and ponds are included in the standards. And then you have to calculate the cable plant loss, including the splitters, as we said earlier, to determine what the total loss will be in the links that you're planning on installing. You compare the pond power budgets to the loss budgets, and if you have excess margin, you're good. If not, it's back to the drawing board. This drawing is just a reminder that when you calculate the loss budget for a passive optical network, you have to include all the fiber, all the connections, and all the splices, just like you would in any other fiber optic cable plant, but you also have to include the losses that are going to be caused by the splitters. You determine the loss of the cable plant with that estimate and compare it to the required power budget of the pond network from OLT to ONT. And that's how you determine whether or not your design is feasible. The next stage of the design process is to set up a testing plan. You have to decide what needs testing and where it will be tested from. Typical fiber optic testing includes continuity to make sure you get from point A to point B, and often polarity because we usually use two fibers. But fiber to the home networks only use one fiber, so you don't have to worry about fiber. We go bi-directional in the same fiber. You need to measure the loss of the network, we call it insertion loss, and compare that to the pond power budget. OTDR traces in passive optical networks are a little bit difficult because the networks work differently up, upstream and downstream. And we're going to talk about that in the next lecture where we'll deal with testing passive optical networks. Once you test them, of course, you need to document them because all of the documentation can be used in the future to troubleshoot the network, especially if you have to do any kind of restoration. In almost any fiber to the home network, cost is always at the top of the priority list. So you might find that the network is installed routinely without comprehensive testing particularly OTDR testing. You may find that the specifications for the network say install the cable plant and turn on the system, check the power level at the subscriber with a power meter, and if the power is within spec, the network is okay and more comprehensive testing is not required. An essential part of every network design, of course, is estimating the cost. The estimating the cost of the installation is generally done as early as possible in the process to establish budgets. Doing your own estimating can be extremely useful if you're trying to evaluate bids on the network to see if they are within reason of what you expect the network to actually cost. Estimating allows comparisons of alternative designs. For example, the centralized versus remote or cascaded splitter designs, which one turns out to be more cost effective. You work with vendors to get the best choices and prices for components, and you can work with multiple vendors 
to get different options at what you might use in your design process, as well as estimating the cost. With every fiber optic network design, one of the most important things is the paperwork. Creating the documents that will be used to bid the network, install the network, operate the network, and if necessary, at some point, restore the network. Every network design should begin with a scope of work. The scope of work is the document that defines what the network is supposed to be when it's finished. It says what kind of communications you will be sending over the network, over what route will it be sent, what kind of equipment you'll use, and what kind of components you'll use in the cable plant. It will also include any special needs or requirements for the installation. For example, if you have to cross bridges or uh, go underwater or where you have to be aerial or underground. This is your specification on which everything else is going to be based. Your loss budgets will be based on the scope of work designs and your project documents, the request for proposal or request for quotes and contracts will all be based on this document. It's that important. In this short video, we can't cover everything you need to know about fiber optic network design. What we've tried to do is cover the unique aspects of fiber to the home design and particularly those of passive optical networks. When you need more resources to find out about the various topics that are dealt with in a design, you can go to the FOA website. Our online reference guide has about a thousand pages of technical information and FiberU has more two dozen free online courses including a course on fiber optic design. We have special sections on fiber optic network design that you can easily use to answer the questions that will arise as you're designing your network. We're the Fiber Optic Association, the International Professional Association of Fiber Optics, and the worldwide known certifying body for fiber optic technicians. You can find out more about the FOA and access the FOA online guide through the FOA website at foa.org. And you can find more than two dozen free online self-study courses at fiberu.org.